And we're going to go ahead and Julie, you could share your screen. And thank you so much. And I'll see you at 245 for the interpreter switch. Thank you, everyone. That sounds good, Marilyn. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start this. Okay. Hello. Um, I'm Julie. And I'm from California Deafblind Services, and um, I want to thank the, I saw some messages popping up in the chat from some friends out there, so I appreciate that. That that always feels good to know that there's people out there and that they're rooting me on, because I always get a little bit jazzed up and slightly nervous before these presentations. Um, I'm super excited for your interest in this topic. Um, it's something that's really interesting to me, and I feel like it's uh, a, a topic that needs to be being discussed in our field because it's uh, this question of whether someone is deafblind and autistic or autistic but not deafblind, all those kinds of questions I think really need to be addressed. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, both autism and deafblindness and why, why they look so much alike and what are some um, ways to think about practices that might be evidence-based for both autism as well as deafblindness and kind of think about how you can merge those to make them fit well for a student who's deafblind. Um, I wanna let you know first off um, that I'm an educator. So I'm a teacher. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a neurologist. I'm not anyone who's a specialist in deafblindness. Um, I have taught many children um, and worked with some adults who have autism. I have worked the same before I joined the DeafBlind Project in California um, 10 years ago. I, um, I had the opportunity when I was working in Berkeley to teach uh, children who, who were DeafBlind. And before that, I worked with adults in the community and three of those people were DeafBlind. So I have, I've kind of got my foot in the water in both areas. And I've always found both individuals with autism and individuals who are deafblind to be just really fascinating. Um, so, so that's just to let you know who I am um, and that I'm not like, I'm not a psychologist or a neurologist trying to uh, make big uh, research-based claims. I'm just sharing my opinions and ideas. Um, the seed for this talk though, really started um, with an article that my, uh, colleague Maurice Belote, who's our coordinator in California, he and I wrote, and you, you can find it, it's on the resource list, but you could find it if you go to our webpage under our newsletter, and if you look for 2014. And it really came up, we were sitting in our office and talking about how we keep hearing from families and from educators about kids who they think, who, who were already had a diagnosis of deaf blindness or and that maybe they had autism too. And so we just kind of want to kind of look at that more closely. And at the time I was, uh, I also teach at San Francisco State in their extensive support needs department. So students with more complex needs um, and multiple disabilities, things like that and autism. Um, and I was teaching a course on autism and it was a super fun course. It was called The Nature of Autism. And it was really kind of just trying to have a better understanding or way to explain how a person with autism, how they view the world differently, how they interpret sensory information differently, um, and looked at a lot of different kind of uh, thoughts or um, theories about how the a person with autism, how their mind works differently. So it was not a class about this is how you teach kids with autism. This is how you diagnose autism. It was really about how, how different and fascinating autism is. And if you can look at it through these different theories, um, you can have a better understanding of it and actually a better kind of it, it, then people with autism kind of fit in more versus it being so different. So because of that class, uh, when we wrote this article, I kind of did the portion of the article that's talking about autism, and Maurice did the part that was more specific to blindness, but deaf blindness. But what we did is after we kind of talked about autism, we then made a, a chart. And if you look at the article, you'll see it's in, there's three columns, and one talks about specific areas of autism, 
and then what that looks like for in a person who has autism. And then the third column talks about why you might see that same behavior in someone who's deaf blind, but we explained it through uh, the lens of someone who's deaf blind is getting sensory information in some kind of different way because either the, the information's missing or it's uh, diminished because they have low vision or, or they're hard of hearing, or it's distorted if there's some kind of brain-based visual or hearing um, problem. Okay, so that's kind of the seed of what got started. Um, now, before I get any deeper too, I kind of want to talk about what I think is important to keep in mind uh, during this uh, presentation is, um, and just when you think about kids who have autism or who are deafblind is, um, they're really puzzling. And if you've been coming to any of these sessions and listening to some of the great presenters they've had, you know, um, you, you, everyone talks about that, but I think it's a really good thing. I think it's a good thing that they're puzzling. Um, I think it really helps us as practitioners. Um, I know it can't be the easiest thing in the world for families, but I also think it ends up being a good thing for many families too, the things that they learn from their children. Um, I also believe really strongly, and I believed this before I even joined the DeafBlind Project, but because um, I've been a special educator for a long time, I really think that um, diagnoses and labels, they can be helpful in terms of the guidance they might provide, but I don't think they should ever de define an individual. Um, and um, I really think that using, taking perspective and demonstrating empathy is really essential if you're gonna get very far in terms of better understanding your own child if, um, or, 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 or teaching an individual who has autism or is deafblind. And then I think the best question to ask really is when you're trying to better understand why someone might be behaving in a certain way or why they might need, the, um, need to follow routines in a certain way or why they might be trying to communicate with you in a different way is really think about what how does the world appear to them right now? How are they feeling about it? Because it's very different than the way we experience it as um, typically developing hearing and sighted people. So um, someone who taught us a lot about this in the field of deaf blindness um, is Jan van Dyke, um, certainly, you know, a, a guru or a hero to a lot of us. Um, and uh, I often go back to this quote when I'm thinking about uh, individuals who are deaf blind, but I, I also think it fits really well with people who are on the autism spectrum. Um, so uh, he said in 2001 that the multisensory impaired person is a unique human being with a unique line of development who's more dependent on a professional's willingness to accept this and act accordingly than any other group of disabled persons. Um, so I think this is really, really important that, and I think the key part of this quote from him is this idea that it's dependent on us as professionals to be willing to accept that they are not going to develop the way that other children develop, whether they're typically developing or whether they're children that have some other kind of developmental delay that it's really, really different with individuals who have a sensory system that is not working for some reason. Be again, because the information's missing or it's diminished in some way or it's distorted, it's not proceeding to the brain in the, in, in the same way. So we really have to accept that and then we actually have to change our practice. And I, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir out there telling everybody that we need to be individualizing for kids who are deafblind, but I also think it's true for kids who um, are um, autistic. I, I've, I've said this so many times, and I'll say it again, but with both groups, autism and deafblindness, I think if you've met one person with autism, hooray for you, you've met one person with autism. You can't take what you know about that child or what you did for that child and, and give it to the next kid and have it work the same way and the same with deaf blindness. So we've got really got to be willing to, to be flexible and creative. Okay, so um, what I'm doing with this presentation is it's kind of in three parts. So this first part, we're gonna talk a little bit about autism and deaf blindness and some connections. The next part, we're gonna look at some evidence-based practices. 
and the idea of dual diagnosis, um, which I'm not going to answer definitively for you because I'm not the person to do that. And then um, we're going to look at how you can actually marry together or combine evidence-based practices in autism to best practices that we know in deaf blindness and have it work for a child who's deaf blind. So this is the first part. So just here's a, a quick definition of autism. There's a lot of them out there. I like this one. Um, and I th think some key things to recognize about it is that it's a neurodevelop neurodevelopmental disability. So it's something that occurs in the brain. So they are processing sensory information very, very differently. Um, usually it shows up in early childhood and it's gonna impact the individual in a lot of ways. But what most people recognize is the different ways that they socialize and communicate, the ways that they form relationships or people's opinion that they aren't interested in relationships, which actually hasn't been my personal opinion. I just think that they do it differently. And also in terms of self-regulation. And just like deaf blindness, it's a spectrum disorder. So it affects people in varying degrees um, differently. So when Maurice and I wrote that article, um, how the three, the, when we made the chart and had the columns, we looked at these um, six areas in particular to kind of dig deeper into. And, um, and these are all things that show up when in the um, DSM-5, which is the psychological manual where um, there's the medical definition for, for autism. So these are all areas that they look at. And if there's differences or really big problems with some of them that affect an individual's functioning in life, day-to-day -day life and social relationships, then um, they could have a problem with autism. So um, it's the areas of, there's delays in both communication development and social skills. Uh, these uh, individuals show really restricted areas of interest. They, there's stereotypical movements that seem strange and odd to us because we don't do them. Um, a lot of these individuals have a big resistance to any kind of change in the environment or changes in their activities are very rigid. Um, people think they're inflexible. Um, we'll talk more about why they might do that and why individuals who are deafblind might too. And um, they have different responses to sensory in, in experiences. They can not notice a lot of things that we would, that we would normally respond to, or they can have really heightened um, responses to sensory experiences, uh, like a child who might have a tantrum when there's a, 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 an unexpected fire drill or something like that, or is in a, is in a noisy cafeteria and just can't handle all the, the lights and the sound and things. Um, and then executive functioning difficulty. So the, the ability to kind of multitask, to plan and then imp, uh, implement something that you want to do. So kind of using those kind of higher level brain activities. So if you think of all of these areas that are key features of autism, it sounds really familiar, I bet, to a lot of you who know individuals um, who are deafblind or perhaps have charge syndrome or something like that. Many of these things we, you see with an individual who is deafblind. So that brings us back to that question of when we hear from families or from teachers, I know this student's deafblind or I know my child's deafblind, do you think they're also autistic? Or, someone, or they, someone said they're acting autistic, should I get them checked out? So if you think about it, there's, there are many reasons why the, these same features would show up in an individual who has deaf blindness or an individual who has charge syndrome that can be explained by the fact that they have issues with vision and hearing. It doesn't have to do with autism or it doesn't have to do with, it could be related to charge syndrome and part of that, the whole phenotype and etiology of charge syndrome. So it doesn't always have to be um, autism. Hey, Julie, let's go ahead and do an interpreter switch. All right. I am not going to rest on this slide too long. Just to let you know, this is what you would find if you're looking in the diagnostic uh, manual um, for the criteria for autism. Uh, the key thing to know is that you have to meet all three of the primary criteria. And all three of the primary criteria have a lot to do with social communication and with social relationships. 
The secondary criteria, you need to meet at least two of them. And this is to get the clinical diagnosis of autism. A lot of these ones are the things that have more to do with the repetition of movements or use of objects and maybe even speech patterns like echolalia and also the kind of the routine, the routinized behavior and the inflexibility that people might notice and also the very intense or different responses to sensory experiences, okay? So um, the other thing about the diagnostic criteria is these, these are also, this is also part of it that's really important. The symptoms show up early in the early developmental period. So we've all heard stories, many times kids who have autism, it's not noticed at first when they're very young until they start to develop language and start to socially interact and then they do it in an atypical way. For some individuals with autism who actually have a lot of language and, um, and in terms of the way they're demonstrating their intelligence, they're not showing any uh, delay. In fact, sometimes they seem ahead of their peers. They read earlier. They seem um, to understand things at a much higher level. But when you notice the difference is when they go to school. And all of a sudden, there's social demands that are put on them in a different environment than their own home. And then so sometimes you don't, some of these kids don't get the diagnosis till they enter preschool or kindergarten. The other thing is the level of impairment needs to be pretty significant. So it's actually really impairing how they get on in life in terms of social and um, occupational or just daily living routines. And finally, and I have this highlighted, the rule outs have to be that um, these, it couldn't be better explained by some kind of intellectual disability or global developmental delay. It doesn't say deaf blindness, but I think this is something to consider if a child has deaf blindness. Could all of those features that you might think that you're seeing, could they also be, be explained just because of the fact that they have um, dual sensory uh, issues. So this kind of brings us to this chicken or the egg question, I think. So are they, is a student appearing to have autism or act autistic because they have deaf blindness? Or uh, is, is it both things? Are they deaf blind, but they also have autism? So there's actually research around this. And there's research that's, that's looked at this. They've looked at congenitally deafblind. There's two areas of research I'm going to talk about here. One was done with congenitally deafblind children, and the other was done with uh, individuals with CHARGE syndrome. Um, so I think it's important that we know that there's research out there that's looked at this. And what they've looked at was those areas of communication and social skill development and sensory behaviors and the ways that they might isolate themselves. Um, I also wanted to put this out here because I know he's a big friend of everybody out there that's been attending these webinars and those that are putting them on is David Brown, who worked with us at California Deafblind Services, he used to say this till he was almost blue in the face every time he heard this question, is why is it that when someone's calling a behavior autistic, they're not calling it deafblind or charge related? And he would always say from my experience and his history as being a teacher of the deaf blind, when someone would explain a behavior in a child who was autistic, he'd say, well, that, that sounds like a deaf blind behavior. So why are we saying that the child's not deaf blind and they're just not using their vision and hearing well in terms of um, how it's being processed in the brain? So just something to think about. David's always putting things out there to kind of challenge us, I think. Um, and what I think is interesting with the uh, Dan Meyer uh, research is that uh, he found three areas where similarities between individuals with autism and uh, people with congenital deaf blindness, and it was in how they social, social interaction patterns, their communication, and then their restricted and repetitive behavior. But the thing is, they were looking at it in terms of behavior. So they were looking at it in a very... Um, you know, ways that you can kind of mark things off and tally them or know what the antecedent was and that they didn't respond to it. So what I think is interesting here is it indicates that the suspicion or a diagnosis someone might have of autism is based on the observations of just looking at the person's behavior, but they're not thinking about, and we know this with deaf blindness, that there's a lot of factors, both internal and external factors that affect how an uh, individual behaves. So whether it's internal and it's self-regulatory and the person trying to, 
dem, you know, figure out the best way to communicate their want or need, or if it's an external factor, like the, the lighting isn't correct, or the sound isn't amplified, or there's too much additional noise um, or visual clutter. There's a lot of things that have to be considered. And if those are considered, does the person still behave in that same way? So I think that's a key difference to think about. And then um, in Tim Hartshorn and his colleagues study, what was interesting was um, his research uh, found that in, he looked at these areas of language and social engagement. So that's something that's important with autism that's different than typically developing. They looked at uh, sensory related movements and behaviors. So, you know, students that rock back and forth or flap or whirl things around and then coping with stressful demands from the environment. And what's interesting is that what their study found is more people with charged into were more socially engaged and had better language and communication than individuals with ASD. And that's personally been true in, in my, my uh, experience. However, people with charged syndrome also engaged in more of those kind of sensory related or maybe self-stimulatory behaviors than other people who are deaf blind. So charge is a little bit different there and it might be something and Tim would, I'm sure, say that it's just part of uh, the charge etiology. These behaviors are there. And, they're, and then David Brown would talk about how they're there for a good reason, because it's providing this, the child with some sensory input that they very much need. So they're accommodating that need on their own by developing movements and behaviors that are helpful and help them to regulate. And then with coping uh, with stressful demands, the responses were very similar to autism. So again, that, that's those, and the stress could be brought on because there's changes to a routine or there's changes to the environment or something unexpected is happening or the demands are too high, okay? So I hope this is making sense. So now I wanna take a short break from me talking. I want you to learn from a family. Um, it's a four minute video. And it's from the uh, National Center on Deaf Blindness. Um, they, do a they have a great section under their family initiatives called Family Matter Stories. And um, they highlight different types of families and different types, different etiologies. And uh, they found this adorable child who I know very well, his family, because they're from California, the Bay Area, like myself. And uh, so uh, I'd like you to look at... Um, we're going to just watch the first introduction of, uh, of Paul. And what I want you to pay attention to is you'll see short, very short clips of Paul. But even when his parents are talking in the interview, and I want you to pay attention to what you learn from them, um, watch him in the background. So he's going to be behaving in ways that I think, and this actually occurred with him, <laughs> teachers and doctors would say, oh, he looks like he's autistic. Okay. But he has charge, so let's 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 learn about Paul's family and Paul. My name is Angelica, and this is my husband Paul. And our son is Paul. He's six years old, and uh, he's he has charge syndrome. And uh, when Paul was born, we didn't know he had, any, he had any issues. So when he was born, about a week later, they said, we think he has Charles syndrome. He was in the hospital for six weeks. And they did the testing. So he came back positive at about five, six months later that he had Charles syndrome. Of course, we didn't know anything about Charles syndrome. And, you know, we're still learning every day new things about Charles syndrome. many health issues. Right now everything's right now everything's under control. Stable. He's stable yeah. and um he has vision and hearing loss, heart issues, um he also has a diagnosis diagnosis of autism.
previous years, we know we were in and out of the hospital. If it was coming for one thing or another, we were always in and out, and we would spend many, many nights in the hospital. He has gone through quite a few surgeries. He is profoundly deaf on one side and moderate on the other side. He wears a Baja hearing aid, which is a bone conductor hearing aid where the sound travels to the bone so he's able to hear and um, right now he like, wears it on one side but he's gonna go in for surgery because he wears a headband so he's gonna go in for surgery so it's gonna be a touch but it's gonna be on both sides his vision you know it's been really hard to find out how much how well he can see for his doctor things that he you know he can see pretty much everything that is close to him we don't know how far he can see and they say he, he's nearsighted he's nearsighted but uh he wears glasses and lately he hasn't doesn't really want to wear those glasses but uh he's able to find the tiny little things on, on the floor so he does use his vision really well. He does have color bombs in both eyes. I mean, it's always a concern because when kids, have, you know, anybody that has color bombs, if there is a fall, if somebody falls or they get a big hit on the head, they can, they can, their retina can detach. So it's always a scary thing, you know. But uh, we try not to think about it because, you know, <laughs> we have so many other things to worry. <laughs> Paul is a really happy kid. He is very loving. He lo I remember a while back he wouldn't be we wouldn't be able to touch him in his hands. Now he loves hugs, kisses. He has these giggles like um, contagious love. Co yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's always happy. He's always happy. He is a happy child. He is always yeah. happy. Even he, though he has, you know, his uh, diagnosis, charge syndrome, I wouldn't trade his personality for a normal kid. You want phone? <laughs> He's looking for the phone. <laughs> So you can find that on the National, oops, the National Center site. Um, so thinking about Paul, and, um, and he is really is, he, he's, the, he's a very happy child, and his laugh is absolutely contagious. Um, it's, it's really fun when, he's in, when he gets going. But, um, and he's currently attending a special education class um, for students with extensive support needs, and is very focused on communication and routines and a lot of um, literacy curriculum, but also a lot of daily living skills. Um, but I think if you think, Paul's a good example, and I think many kids with um, charge syndrome or deaf blindness, if you go back to this diagnostic criteria, and I'm trying to see if I put this up, I think it's hard to say that he meets the top ones. Because you, as you saw, Paul, there's a lot of emotion, so, social emotional connection with his family, and you see it with other people that he's familiar with. He was definitely using a lot of nonverbal communicative behavior to interact and let his mom know what he was doing. And he, you know, he's, he doesn't have those same deficits in understanding who are the important people in his life. And, and the, he has strong relationships with his cousins, friends in school, things like that. But what you might see with Paul is he does have those stereotyped repetitive movements. He does like things to kind of be the same. And he likes, you know, um, and in terms of patterns that he does, like you, there's other parts of the video that you can watch. It comes in clips where you'll see that his favorite thing is to do certain things at the park, to say, take the same walk while he's riding in his wagon in the neighborhood, things like that. Um, so oftentimes I think with deaf blindness, what you'll see is 
you might see a lot of these types of behaviors, which could be checked off. And remember, you just need two of those for the autism diagnosis, but it has to be two as well as these top three. And this is where I feel like sometimes when I've had these conversations with families or with uh, teachers who are kind of wondering and questioning whether a child is both deaf blind or has charge syndrome and deaf blind and autism on top of that, I always go back to this and say, well, actually I see a real desire for social connection. And I see them using a lot of non verbal communicative behaviors to make, you know, to, to engage with you and to, and to communicate. So just that's something to think about. Again, this is not me being a psychologist or a neurologist, but just talking to you as an educator who's worked with um, a lot of individuals. With hey, Julie, let's heart. go ahead and, and do an interpreter switch, please. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So, and then what Maurice and I finish up with at the end of the article is just actually, let's be honest with ourselves and realize that all of us fall somewhere on the spectrum. So maybe as individuals with autism seem so kind of different or atypical from us because um, the ways that all of these manifest in terms of how they communicate, what their interests are, their movements, their inflexibility in terms of change, their difficulty with executive functioning, um, and even responses to sensory behaviors, we all fall somewhere in there. It's just that a lot of us have figured out through life and through incidental learning throughout our whole life, ways to kind of do this in ways that are socially acceptable or they're socially, maybe better way to say it is socially understood. Okay, so, and again, if you go back to the article, we give a lot of examples, um, but I, I have a couple that I wanna share with you right now before we'll stop for a little check-in on that uh, questions, but, um, Maurice, uh, when we did this presentation together one time, or a couple times, he found this, uh, he had this great insight, and I think it's really true, um, is all of us like kind of get through life by following rat habits and routines, because it makes life easier to get through and it makes it more orderly. Now, I know right now, since we're, you know, going into almost a year of living <laughs> in very small communities and maybe just one or a couple different environments, um, we're probably sick of the habits and routines that we're in and we want to change. But actually, back pre-COVID life, um, it was something that made things easier, that we followed the same route to work, that you had the same routine in the morning when you got up and got ready to go to work or get the kids off to school. Most people, when they go to the grocery store, follow the exact same route every time. You might even fill out your grocery list in a way that you know what's going to be in the produce section, what's going to be in the meat section, and actually break it up. We do these things because it makes life manageable. If, we, if everything was unexpected every day, it would be pretty exhausting. So, um, so just keep that in mind that, that we're all somewhere on the spectrum. Um, I thought now what might be fun would be for us to do a little pop quiz um, to have you kind of think about this and reflect. Um, so think about these questions. How many of you, while you've been listening to me, have been maybe swinging or uncrossing your legs or maybe twisting your hair or, or biting your nails or clicking your top of your pen, maybe rocking in your chair, <laughs> right? So there's a lot, we, and we are doing these things because it's helping us to pay attention right now because you're just, you're once again spending a day looking at a screen and listening to someone else tell you something. And we're all getting a little tired of that, but it's, 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 these are regulatory things that we do all of the time. So individuals who are deafblind, individuals who have autism do these things too, but they do them in ways that we think aren't right because they're doing it as you saw Paul spinning around in the background and clapping his hands when he's out on a walk. And when he walks, he likes to stamp his feet. But those are all things that he's just doing because it's helping him with regulation and it's just fine. Um, how many people jump when they hear fireworks or a siren? Or have you ever walked out of a restaurant before you were seated because something just didn't smell right and you couldn't handle that input? Or get headaches from going to the mall or cut 
your tags out of your clothes before you can wear them. So these are all things that are examples that we can change. These are all things that many of us do, but we can make environmental adaptations and changes. You don't have to go to a, or to go to a restaurant that doesn't smell good, or um, you can avoid going to the mall. You can find other different kinds of shops. So there's things that we can do and we already do in our own lives. And we can do that for, for children who need those kind of environmental accommodations. And then finally, and this is the one that we almost get just like this really bothers us is when people um, have certain behaviors or habits that aren't what we would do. And we decide to kind of make them stop it <laughs> or change it. Um, but how many people like avoid sidewalk cracks? because you don't want to break your mother's back or have to set up your desk just the right way. Like you have to be very organized or have a lucky item with you. Or many of us always, you know, do that same route to work or like to park in the same spot when we go to work or the grocery store or the library. Um, so again, these are all things that we do because it, it helps us in terms of kind of regulating the world around us and our sensory input. And Individuals with autism and individuals who are deafblind have figured out ways to do this too. They just do it in ways that are to us kind of more obvious and kind of strange or weird. And we've decided that, oh, that's not kind of right. We got to make you fit into this mold. And I, for one, don't think uh, that's as important to worry about. And I also don't think it usually is very effective because uh, these individuals are really good at just figuring out some other way to get that regulation. So just something to think about, okay? So I think now we're to the point, Marilyn, where I wanted to see if there's anything out there that's unclear or that needs to be answered. And this is Marilyn speaking so far. There's nothing in the chat box, just people agree. And of course, as far as what the uh, little pop quiz you had, but no, so far, no questions or comments in the chat box. Okay. And. Looks like people are still awake, so you're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Now we're going to get into this whole idea of dual, dual diagnosis, you guys. This is a quick, again, this is my, my, mine and Maurice's opinion about this. I think the biggest reason that people suggest dual diagnosis is because the behaviors look really similar in, between deaf blindness and autism or charge and autism, okay? And guess what? The second one is, People don't know about deaf blindness and charge syndrome. Medical professionals, educational professionals don't know this as well as they know autism, right? Okay. So it's great that there's more awareness about autism now. It's really, really great that autism is accepted in a way in general society, like it certainly wasn't when I was growing up. So bravo. But people don't have that same awareness and experience with deaf blindness and charge syndrome, although it's really, really growing. Um, too, with the, I think with the help of social media and so many advocates out there. Um, the other thing is so many school systems in the last decade have invested a lot of resources in training their staff, getting materials and services that are very specific to autism. So if they see a kid who looks like he has autism, even though it's not autism, it's charge, or the child's deaf blind, they say, oh, he belongs there. Or we have a teacher that knows these, this has gotten this training or has this curriculum, this, this is who will serve him. So instead of thinking about a deaf blind program. And then um, labels can be helpful. So some families and support providers, including our friend Paul, um, they actually, once someone suggested autism, they actually, sought it out because it actually got him a lot more services. It got him a lot of in-home services that were super helpful. He was getting some behavioral services and supports at school, but he couldn't get those at home and he needed them there. Now, charge syndrome couldn't get him that resource. Autism could through the regional center. So sometimes it can actually be helpful. So I think sometimes that's why it occurs. Um, and so what Maurice and I summed up in our article is that um, deaf blindness and autism may look alike because they really impact the way an individual accesses and processes the sensory information in their environment. But they're doing it in two different ways. For a child who's, uh, who has autism, 
It has to do with how they're processing that information. There's nothing wrong with their vision and hearing. There's nothing wrong with their ability to touch things, but how their brain is processing it makes it very different. Now for a, someone who's deaf blind, the difference is that the sensory input is either missing, they're completely blind or deaf, or it's diminished, they're low vision, hard of hearing, or it's distorted, there's some kind of brain-based problem going on. So you'll see these similarities, this insistence on routines and the behaviors and the difficulty with executive functioning and that delay in the social skills or, or their communication. But it's all because of how, how their ability to get sensory information and also process sensory information. Very interesting, I think. Um, Leo Kanner, who um, in uh, the United States was the person who kind of first diagnosed autism in people and, and kind of gave this name to it, um, said uh, that a feature of it is this anxiously obsessive desire for the maintenance of sameness. Um, and certainly if you know individuals with autism, it would be something, or even if you've seen movies or TV shows, like if you watch The Good Doctor or something like that, you kind of recognize this. Um, but think about individuals or students, you know, or children in your own family who have uh, deaf blindness or, or, or charge syndrome. They also demonstrate this. And why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you, if you were not getting, if your vision and hearing weren't allowing you to get all the information that everybody else had, you're going to kind of want that, that reliability, that security, um, that having things be in expected places, happen in an expected order, in an expected way with expected people, that would be something that would actually provide a lot of uh, assurance and, and security and relieve your stress. So not a bad thing. Um, the next two slides just talk about what would be benefits and then what would be potential pitfalls to a dual diagnosis. So here's some good things about dual diagnosis, I think. Um, oftentimes, it, it helps make sure that kids are placed or served, serves a better word, in really structured and educational environments that are predictable, like we just talked about that being important. And also a diagnosis could possibly provide some effective intervention or services, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and then oftentimes autism uh, interventions are very focused on communication and social skill development. And they actually do think about sensory processing. So that is actually good versus just a more general kind of educational approach or special ed approach. And then oftentimes families find a lot of support, um, both social and in, in informational support by connecting with other families that might have similar challenges. So I think that I've, in my experience, that has actually been super helpful to families too. The potential problems are though, is that if a student is deaf blind and doesn't kind of fit into an autism program, and I'm gonna give you an example in the second part of the talk of a specific girl um, who that happened to, um, and oftentimes ASD uh, interventions are very focused on, on behavior and they're not thinking about the sensory and communication needs of children with deaf blindness, which are very unique and different than someone who is just um, processing sensory information differently. Um, so they're not thinking about the accommodations and um, adaptations and assistive technology that can really help with, um, and, and also just physical supports that a say a child with charge syndrome, um, may need. Um, sometimes that diagnosis of autism becomes the primary diagnosis. And then the people on the team aren't as interested in learning about deaf blindness or about charge syndrome. So, um, so everybody just sees the kid as autistic and doesn't think about the other uh, sensory issues. And then um, sometimes it actually limits a child. It doesn't provide them with the educational opportunities they should have because um, it's, it's, uh, it's just kind of placing a child in one particular type of program and it's not giving um, help, additional helpful information to the team. Okay, so those are what I think are the problems with it. 
So final thoughts about dual diagnosis. So again, I'm not saying it, it can happen that whether it can happen or not. This is a really big debate in the field. And I'm certain and I know that there's people out there, um, certainly families out there, I know who your children have dual diagnosis, and I am in no way trying to say that that's incorrect. Um, clearly, there are individuals uh, who have both, but I, what I'm trying to talk about today and have people reflect on is whether um, we're too easily kind of putting multiple labels on a child. So... Um, First, you've got to figure out if those, those autistic characteristics or behaviors could be explained by the dual sensory or multisensory issues. Um, did the person that was doing the assessment of the, of the person uh, know deaf blindness and no deaf blind education? And so it has to include someone that knows that. Um, the other thing to think about is what's the additional label offering? Is it helpful? Is it gonna change things about the program? Is it gonna help the family get more resources? Is it gonna connect them to more supports? If not, is, is, it, is, it, is it offering anything that's helpful? And then um, what evidence-based instructional methodologies related to autism would be most appropriate for this particular child? Um, if they're not gonna be helpful and not all students who are deafblind need these types of interventions, then there's really no reason to have that additional label on there. It's more important, I think, that the team knows that that child has both vision and hearing issues and possibly other sensory issues. Okay, so here's my friend Jet. Her parents gave me permission to share this story and um, and a little bit about her. She is the child who, um, for me, it became really important that I started to present about uh, autism and deaf blindness. She has charge syndrome. Um, and when she was four years old, I was asked to go do some technical assistance with her uh, preschool team. And um, she was being served in a preschool that was uh, very much set up following all these autism or ASD interventions and um, had all kinds of resources, great training. There were every child in the classroom had a behavioral aid so, so that they had been trained in all these ABA techniques. And um, my issue was, is after I went, I, 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 I did a home visit with her the night before I went to the school and met the family and just saw how remarkable she was. And at this point, she was, um, she was, she was a pretty emerging communicator. The family was using sign language, total communication, sign language and spoken language. She was not signing very much. She wasn't speaking very much. She was, she was approximating some signs and her, her, and to this day, her speech is hard to understand. Um, which isn't uncommon with some kids with charge. So I went to her school the next day and really nice people, very attentive, kids getting a lot of attention, but everything was set up where kids work individually. They kind of had their own stations and these were three, four and five-year-olds and they were working in these little like kind of separate individual stations and not a lot of social connection. Um, and she, several times during the day kind of had, she, you'll see pictures of her later on where she's asleep in a bean bag covered with a really heavy blanket because she would be exhausted after 60 to 90 minutes of work. There was just so much sensory output that she was putting out there. Um, not really hard demand. She was doing activities like you saw with Paul where he was putting the, the numbers into the clock, but it was just, it was very kind of repetitive. There was a lot of this reinforcement right away. It was very adult led. But what happened that day was that she went <laughs> to the speech room and she was with her uh, aide, who was a behavioral aide, and another teacher, it might've been the speech therapist, and she, she was going to there and uh, they got to a closed door and they said, uh, Jet, what do, you, what, what do you want? And she was supposed to say open so that they would open the door. And she kept, she just kept signing open, open. And, they weren't acknowledging it. They kept saying, what do you say? And, and were prompting her and she was getting more and more upset. It was her, her level of stress was rising so high and it was really uncomfortable for me that I finally said, 
she's telling you open. She just signed open. And they said, no, she needs to say it. So I counted to three, took a deep breath. <laughs> and then later on in the our three briefing meeting, and they did, they opened the door then, but, and then took a while to calm her down. In the debriefing meeting, I brought it up again. I said, I just don't understand. She communicated to you, you need to acknowledge that. And they said, well, open's one of her target words this week. So that's the word. So they had, the, again, it was just very behavioral and they weren't going to accept a child very clearly. This wasn't even like an approximation. She was signing open. And so I talked to Maurice. I got very upset. Talked to Maurice. <laughs> and he said, um, well, he goes, if they know autism already, maybe what you need to do is do a training with them about charge syndrome, but connect it to what they already know about autism. So don't go in and tell them you have to throw everything out and do it this way. Look at what they're doing already and see how would that work for her. So that's what I did. And it ended up actually being very successful for this team. So it's kind of what I'll do today with you for the rest of the session. Okay, so that's Jet. She's so cute. Some of you, if you went to the charge conference, might have met her and her family. Um, just want to quickly say what I'm going to talk about now or, um, or in the rest of the session. I will be, will be referring to practices that are evidence-based. It's very important in our field that we are using strategies that are supported by research and that there's evidence to show that it works for that particular group of learners, okay? So, and there's evidence base for autism as well as deaf blindness. It's a little more documented. There's more research that's been done in the area of autism. These are all in your resource packet. Don't worry about this slide, but I'm just letting you know there's plenty out there in terms of knowing what the evidence base is for ASD, deaf blindness, and charge. It's all on your resource list. Um, and they're all, they would all be, they're all accessible and they would all be great to review if you're interested. So for autism, these are nine, the nine interventions that have the highest level of research that they know for sure have enough evidence to say that they're well-documented and should be used with children with, with autism. So most, these are established practices. They're, they're not questioned by people, in, by researchers in the field, by educators. And this is what a lot of the practices that our teachers are trained in and that the curriculum and how they set up classrooms for autism think about. So they think about all of these areas. And what I wanna do is show how you can connect that to deafblind practices. Now, my concerns about those practices that I just showed you and, pri and only using autism focused interventions with a child who's deafblind are the following. First is that many of them are very adult directed and initiated. The adult is making the demand and the student gives the response and then they're reinforced for it. And if the student doesn't give the correct response, as I just gave you the example with, with Jet, then they're prompted again. And then they might be self-corrected, but they're not going to get the reinforcer. It's very adult directed and initiated, which is not follow the child, which is what we know child-led initiations and following the child's motivators and interests is a highly effective deafblind practice. There's also a really strong focus on behave, this behavioral model, that there's a certain way to do it, the child does it that way, or there's a correction. There's some inflexibility with some ASD interventions, not all and not by all practitioners. I've met plenty of practitioners in the ASD world who have been trained like this, but actually are able to kind of be more creative and flexible and make it match and fit the child. But oftentimes certain ones, if you're gonna do them um, with rigor and the way that um, people, uh, th the way that it's been shown in research to work, then you can't kind of change the order, change the way you do it. Um, there's a focus on communication and reciprocal social skills, but without a consideration of the child's multisensory needs. So they might be this whole thing of like learning how to make eye contact or to wave at someone or have a response like, hello, when someone greets you without kind of thinking about, well, the child might not see that person clearly. They, uh, they might not have the motor skills to do the waving. They might not be able to hear a person in the room. So they're not thinking about those other things. They're just expecting that you're gonna have this communicate because they teach it in a very kind of behavioral rote way versus a, a, a more kind of in context way. 
And then for a lot of kids who are deafblind, they actually need additional visual and um, auditory cues and supports. And so an example might be for a lot of autism classes, they, they use a picture communication system, PECs. And lots of times these are just kind of small icons that are black and white drawings, or sometimes there's color to them, but they might not be the visual or auditory, that might not be a large enough visual cue for a child. They might need a calendar box or a photograph, things like that. Or they might not be able to hear the auditory cue that's supposed to help the child know that this activity is over and now we move to the next, things like that. So those are my concerns about using these interventions without, uh, without modifying them. And so uh, Probst and Borders in 2017 did a really nice lit review. And what they looked at were evidence-based practices for ASD. And then they thought about deaf blindness and they, um, and they talked about uh, how, how you merge the two. And interestingly enough, in their lit review, they mentioned mine and Maurice's article a lot, which I thought was interesting because we weren't, it wasn't a research article. It was just our musings about this, but, um, so, and they, they listed other things too, but that was one of them. But I think this is a really good article. It's one of the ones I listed because what they talk about is that um, we actually need to look at evidence-based uh, practices for autism and really identify if they're working well enough for deafblind learners and, if, and what kind of modifications need to be made. Um, they also talk about that they've got to always be mat individualized and match that individual's needs. And, and you've got to think about the sensory losses, as I just mentioned on the previous slide. But finally, that assessment has to include a professional who's knowledgeable in deaf blindness. And as we all, or well, many of us out there in the field know of education, especially those of us working with kids who are deaf blind, we know that that's often the missing piece. There's not a teacher of the deaf blind on the child's caseload. There's not a, a, a VI or, um, a teacher of the deaf who is as knowledgeable in deaf blindness as they ought to be. Um, so that, that, that's an issue. So that's something to, to keep in mind. It's, it's, it's a good research article if you're into that. Now, here is a list of um, focus areas for children and youth who are deaf blind that many of you, if you're in the field, are um, familiar with. These are the things that we think about all the time when those of us who are doing technical assistance. These are the things we look for when we get to a classroom. Those of you who are educators or early interventionists, these are things that you're thinking about setting up in your classroom or helping families set up in the home. So um, it's everything from communication and concept development to thinking about orientation and mobility, but also accommodations, um, what, what the curriculum looks like, is it age respectful as well as meaningful? Um, and then how, what we also have to always be thinking about social relationships, I think. I think that's something that's often overlooked in school that we're not, but it's actually probably the most important part of school for most children. Um, it's the thing that everybody remembers from school or, were the peers and the connections that they made, not always all the, the lessons that they learned or tests they took. Um, and then finally, self-determination. So. I'll stop here to see if there's any burning questions and let every, everybody can stretch if they want, stand up and walk around. <laughs> so this is Marilyn speaking. So I'm just looking in here and um, Mosley was saying it's hard enough to get a TOD hard of hearing or a TVI, much less both, <laughs> of course, deafblind specialist. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is good. Oh, we're doing good. Yeah, yeah, we're doing really well. Um, but so far, that was just pretty much the only comment within this strand here. Okay. Well, I, I agree with that comment, and that's why we're, we continue to work so hard for interveners and teachers of the deafblind. And um, yeah, because it, it, yeah, that's the whole thing of then how you, if you don't have someone like, this is, a, this is another chicken and the egg issue. If you don't have that on the team, then sometimes what I find is teams don't even recognize what they don't know, right? You don't know what you don't know. Um, so you don't even know that you need to find your state deafblind project 
and ask them to come out and provide some training and technical assistance. Um, it oftentimes falls on families to be the people providing that information. Um, yeah, it's, this is an issue. That's, that's a really big, that's a big issue, the whole pre-service and, and the same thing with autism too. I mean, there's that, I know in our program at San Francisco State, both deaf blindness and autism are covered in the um, pre-service, but it's covered along with everything else. So it's just a smattering. So, um, but if, if you're lucky enough to get someone on the team, a TVI or a TOD, one of them that can kind of be the person that will take the lead on at least providing some information and maybe helping you get connected to the state deaf blind project, that would be a good thing. Okay. Right. So Julie, I just wanted to let you know real quick, Stephanie in here mm -hmm. uh, said for early intervention, Alabama is using, oops, I hate when this thing moves after a while. <laughs> Alabama is using the, as soon as I read it, it changes, RBI for all children and families. Do you feel that is appropriate or should the professional choose an assessment that may focus more on sensory impairments? I don't know. The RBI? And that's all they gave. Correct. Yeah, I don't know what that is. And then maybe they'll respond, but just let you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, and, and Stephanie says, quick, you're quick on your feet there, Stephanie. Uh, quick response was a uh, routine-based interview. Yeah, well, that, interview, that, that's, yeah, I think the routine-based interview is good. And the ones that I like to use are ones that usually ask about sensory preferences and things like that or sensory issues. So I would use that kind of, I know early intervention really does do a lot of routine-based um, interviews, but I would look for one. And you can find this on the National Center's website. Um, they've got a, li a great list of assessment resources. Um, it's got to also take into consideration how the child's using their different senses. Because even if they have a vision loss um, and hearing issues, to, to determine what levels their hearing is at and what functional ways they're using their hearing and what level their vision is, um, that could be helpful. And ways they're using it and when they're using it, what's motivating, yeah. And so Julie, one more, uh, Key, Key says, K-E-Y, -K I'm probably totally pronouncing it wrong. Um, I'm working with deaf students with ASD as a teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing. Many parts you mentioned are also very relevant to the learners that I'm working for, and I'm applying them too, so thank you. really want to be sure you're aware of that. Um, mm -hmm. So that kind of gives you also just a little bit, um, a lot of the application that you're giving for yeah. the, all of our presenters out there, so thank yeah. you. I have, okay. I've, I've seen much more interest in the deaf world, deaf education in, in autism now and recognizing that and providing some additional supports. So that's great to hear. So this is how simple I think it can be. <laughs> it's not really that simple because you have to go do it now. Um, but I really think the ways to bridge these deaf blind practices and the evidence-based practices for ASD is to first you always think of the individual um, and then you have to select interventions that fit that child's learning profile. It is not going to work to take a kid and try to make them fit into a particular curriculum or training model. You have to look for practices and approaches that are child-led and that are implemented in natural contexts. So not teaching skills outside of context. There's no way that you can develop the concepts and the understanding of the skills a child's learning or the concepts they're learning if you're not doing it right in the place, in the environment, and in the routine where they're needed. You have to always think about their sensory needs and make sure they've got access, the types of supports, and that you're thinking about their sensory preferences. So you might think, as you heard earlier with Paul, that a child who has vision and hearing loss, you, okay, great, we'll do everything for, through touch. Well, at first he didn't want any, he didn't want to use his hands and he didn't want anyone else to touch his hands. So think about their preferences and then consult with those deafblind specialists. And then um, this is really important, everybody. We have to make sure that we're giving, and that's part of the reason I like to do this presentation. We have to give families accurate and complete information about ASD features and interventions. So if you're going to talk about all those criteria of ASD, make sure the family understands it and that your, their child has to meet those criteria. Um, 
talk about those different features of ASD, the, the circle graph I showed with the six features, and talk about how that could also be explained through deaf blindness or charge. And then if you're talking about ASD interventions, make sure the family understands why you chose that intervention. So what I wanna do now for the remaining part is I'm gonna take, you'll see up in the green box, up in the corner, there's a green box. It'll say ASD and it's gonna list one of the uh, um, evidence-based practices. And then what I'm gonna do is list over on the other side, deaf blind, and what would be something that would be similar to that in the deaf blind practice. And then ways that you would then adapt or individualize this ASD evidence-based practice. And then most slides have pictures of kids I've worked with. Um, so the first one is just individualized supports and services. And for deaf blind, I think that always goes back to it has to be child guided. We know that. We know that from Jan Van Dyke. We know that from Kathy Nelson. We know that from David Brown. We know that from all the good work people are doing in the deaf blind program at Perkins. We know this works. So follow the child, make sure you're, you're motivating them. No, no child's gonna wanna engage and learn a new skill, understand a concept if they're not interested and motivated, okay? We think about the child's preferences and then thinking about what are, what are they most interested in? That's the way to entice them to wanna participate in an activity or, or engage in instruction with you. And then joining the child, right? So doing that reciprocal turn-taking, all of these good things that we know from looking at deafblind training modules, watching other presenters, being in classrooms with kids, and then continually build it. We, we want the child to be gaining independence, to showing, in, showing initiation. So we're gonna build whenever the child makes an initiation or demonstrates an action or attempts to use language, whether it's spoken or, or signed or gestured, okay? So all of that, we're gonna acknowledge it and we're gonna build upon it. And we're gonna make sure that they have lots of choices. We're gonna think about self-determination already in, in this way and allow them to feel in control. And then finally figuring out just if the child can't do the whole activity or isn't ready to engage in the whole activity or interested, then we're gonna look at partial. We're gonna to try to make sure that the student is succeeding, not failing, okay? And there's a photo of a girl playing with some maracas at music. So that was the way she participated because she wasn't able to sing. And then a student who's out exploring in his school garden um, at his own pace, right? So he was doing it differently than the other kids in the class. Um, Systematic instruction is super important to autism, um, and it's a, one of the strong. It's actually the probably the area they have the strongest evidence, um, and this is really works great for students who are deaf blind as well because they're not learning about the world incidentally. There's so much that they miss with that vision or hearing loss. So we want to make sure that we're breaking things down, and we're thinking about having making sure they have repeated and direct experiences. Um, making the steps very small so that they can, again, be successful and um, focusing on always in every routine, thinking about in including them in the beginning, the middle, and the end. So things don't just appear, like materials aren't put in front of them, they do one part of it and then someone takes it away. They really understand where things come from, what each step of the routine is, putting things away, all of that. So but every, you're thinking about each, very deliberately thinking about all steps in a routine. And um, once you get in the practice of this, you, I, I find that you kind of always think this way. I think this way about a lot of things in my life now, what are just the step-by-step -step things that I need to do. What also helps I think is really connecting it to the child's home um, or experience. So making it, making meaningful reference points for the child. And there's a photograph here of me working with a, a girl who is learning to pot. She's going to pot some flowers into a larger pot. So it, it took quite some time for her to do that, but we just did it step by step. Okay, pacing and practice. Um, and this is, again, connected to those individual supports. Um, students who are deafblind need a lot more time. They have to gather the information. It has to be processed in their brain. They have to determine how, what the response is gonna to be. To learn new things, to respond to other people, this takes time. You have to give them time. Let them work at their pace, do not rush them. 
if you use an activity-based curriculum, a curriculum that allows for you to stop for a while and then return to it, that can be very helpful because it can provide movement breaks for the child or they allow them to get into different positions. And then I think it's really important to just really learn how to pause and provide time at the beginning or at the next step of a routine for the child to show you that they're ready to continue and that they're comfortable with their response. So just kind of slow things down. Again, this can be something that I've seen in some classes that use ASD interventions. Things happen pretty fast. They prompt a child, the child doesn't respond, and then they prompt them right away again. Or they tell them, oh, you're not ready, would take the material away. So we just have to give these kids more time and just kind of wait and see that you can tell that that they're that the lights light bulbs going off right they're getting it environmental adaptation so this another key thing that's great with um, autism uh, practices is how structured the learning environments are they do set things up that everything's very orderly they are trying to take kind of take away that element of uh, surprise or things that could uh, uh, distract be distracting so that works really well in terms of the kind of environmental adaptations you wanna think about for a learner who's deaf blind. So organized learning spaces, using a calendar system or some kind of schedule system that they're following so they know, you know wh what I'm doing now, but what's coming next, what they might be able to refer back to what happened the day before, the week before, that students have access to materials that are of high interest, right? So again, they can we're building independence, building choice and self-determination that um, we want to use intriguing routines and activities and we want to rotate them because we don't want kids, we all kind of, even though routine is important, we want to switch things out sometimes to keep things interesting and motivating as well. Um, for learners who are deafblind, you have to think about all modes of ways to provide the information. So I feel like autism classes are very focused on a lot of visual supports. So you also have to think about amplifying auditory supports and tactual modes, paying a lot of attention to auditory and visual clutter as well as lighting, that'll be something that's important, and then a variety of seating options, especially for uh, students who have balance issues, and then a safe place for the kid just to go charge and relax. So I talked about earlier, this is what our friend Jet had to do, really, after every 60 or 90 minutes of instruction, she was done, she was spent. She was spending so much time just keeping herself regulated and pulled together to be focused, she would just go and crash for 20 minutes. And she'd lay on this beanbag, put heavy blankets over her. And then when she got up, she was kind of refreshed and ready to go again. Planned transitions and routines is another piece of that structured learning environment. So again, that predictability, I talked earlier about that when I talked about the insistence on sameness. This provides so much reassurance and sense of security, which can reduce stress and anxiety, which makes it easier to learn. None of us learn best when we're feeling anxious or stressed. It also allows a child to initiate and take more independence because they know what's expected. They know how to do things. Um, thinking about visual markers, this is a picture. I, sh I use this example a lot. Some of you may have seen it in other presentations I've done, but this is uh, at a preschool for the deaf. And um, this child had charge syndrome and these, they had different outside of different rooms that she used at the preschool, her classroom, the partner classroom, the speech and language therapist room, um, the, the sensory room. There was a different frame. I think they just got it from Michael's or the dollar store and each one had a different uh, texture. So it was sandpaper or bubble wrap or some kind of crinkly stuff that she could feel. So she could kind of see it, but she, Tactually, she felt that. And then when she would transition, so say she's in the speech and language therapist's office and she was going back to the classroom, they'd show her the bubble wrap so that she'd know, okay, when I'm leaving here now, this is the thing I'm getting ready to go do. Um, and then, of course, uh, object calendars and schedules can be super, um, super helpful. And then always, just not surprising kids, making that part of helping them know what's coming up, what's... Um, making, checking your calendar, checking your schedule, part of just the routine and never forgetting that. It's helpful if, if there's any way that the calendar can be something that's portable, that's best if kids go a lot of places. 
meaning cur meaningful curriculum. So ASD uses a lot of specialized curriculum and for a deaf blind child, you just have to make sure it's really meaningful and connected to their life. Um, and don't underestimate these kids. They have so many abilities that they're not able to demonstrate as soon as typically developing kids. Many of these kids remember spend a lot of their early years in hospitals, um, away from school. Um, so, uh, but, and also thinking about making sure the curriculum is the same curriculum that other kids their age would be using, but provide them with adaptations, connecting it to their own life. Um, and looking for all those opportunities to teach concepts, whether it's basic concepts that they may have missed growing up, or it's those prerequisite concepts that we know are important to learn for kids who are proficient communicators who just might not know how large a train really is or understand, um, you know, uh, what, maybe what, um, what, what someone who works in a bank does, things like that. I'm, I'm pulling ideas of prerequisite concepts out of the air from uh, ones I've heard from other people. Um, oh, and then active versus pa passive participation. This is something else I think happens a lot for kids who are deafblind. I think they're often, they're in a classroom, they're not making, they're, they're not making a lot of uh, trouble. <laughs> Or, or acting out or anything. So everybody thinks everything's okay, but they're actually not very engaged or participating. So I think thinking about there's ways that you can really actively engage them. And that might mean that they're gonna, sometimes they're gonna be doing activities that require movement. And sometimes they're gonna be doing things that are seated. So alternating that. Um, the This slide just talks about behavior. So this is another area where I think autism, um, because they use applied behavior analysis principles can be super helpful. But I think you've got to specifically think about deaf blindness. There's some considerations that you've got to think about, um, specifically thinking about whether there's uh, the behavior is etiology specific, such as with charge syndrome, but also thinking about um, whether um, th thinking about sensory issues that internal and external factors. So it can be harder to, diff to identify the exact function of the behavior with a child who's deaf blind, because it might not be something that's immediately apparent in the environment, it might be something internal and in terms of self-regulation. Um, if you haven't read it yet, Hartshorn and Brown and others wrote a really great um, article about thinking about issues of pain, stress, and anxiety and sensory deficits um, in terms of re re those are the things that bring about behavior. So the behavior is um, is, uh, is, is uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm sorry, it's getting late. <laughs> it's okay, Julie, let's go ahead and do an interpreter switch while yeah. you think about that for a second, okay? And this will be the last interpreter switch. Thank okay, you. Okay, and I just thought of it. See? <laughs> it's a result. So the behavior you see is a result of possibly pain that the child isn't able to express or stress or anxiety they're feeling or some kind of unmet sensory need. Um, and then finally, I'll just point out again, as our friend David has told us so many times, we, we need to move past thinking of these behaviors as a problem or as wrong if and more as they're actually creative adaptations, that they're actually demonstrating the intelligence and the creativity of the individual. And as long as it's not harming them or harming other people, we really need to get around whether it's this is just one of those things that it bothers me or something like I just really can't live with. Um, and then you, when you teach a, be, a replacement behavior, a, a different behavior, it always has to do this, have the same function as the behavior that you're replacing. So it has to be, if they're doing it because they need, have an unmet sensory needs, you've got to find another way for them to get that. And you've got to practice it in natural context. Um, I want to end with just a short video clip I'm going to show you of my friend Mackenzie here, because I think this is something too that's it's certainly true with charge syndrome, but it's I think it's true with a lot of people who are with deaf blindness. They they are always functioning at this maximum sensory threshold, right? Because they're missing information. So they're needing to use so many other senses to get that in. It's exhausting. The example I share a lot is like imagine being in a new city that you've never been to. It's raining or snowing outside. It's nighttime. And you're trying to find your friend, you're going to your friend's house to 
for dinner and you're trying to find that place and you've never been there. So just think about how, how, what that feels like if you've ever been in that situation, driving in a rainy night in an unfamiliar place and you have to do this one particular task, right? A lot of individuals who are deaf blind, that's, that's what life is like. Imagine doing that 24 seven. So there's a need for sensory breaks and these kids kind of figure out how, how to get that and ways to do that. And there's a lot of you know, good outcomes of it. It really does help to refocus and reduce their stress. So there's lots of materials and spaces and activities that can be helpful. But the most important thing is educators and interveners need to be able to read that child. So when you're thinking about a classroom, you have to be able to, the kids can't only have breaks at certain times. That's why we have recess. That's why we have lunch at school. So kids have that break from learning. These kids need it more often. But let me show you this really short video of this, my friend Mackenzie here. She's at a birthday party in the city. She's having a super fun time. It's outdoors, it's at a park. She's been running around. She's been going up and down the slide. Lots of people are talking to her. There's, there's been cake and cookies and pizza, a um, lot of noise. At one point she goes, so and this has been going on for about 90 minutes, okay? She's having fun. Then she goes over to a, a chair that was set up at the party that someone wasn't sitting in at the moment. And just pay attention to what she does with her hands and then the rocking movement she does. And then I'll show you what she did right after this. Okay, then it ended, okay? So she's, she's doing something that looks it looks kind of autistic. That's what people would say. Or if someone walked by the party at that point might say, oh, I bet that kid has autism because everybody knows about autism now, right? But it certainly doesn't look like what a typical seven-year-old does at a birthday party. Now I'll show you what happened just moments later. <laughs> Here's the birthday boy's father and he was blowing up balloon animals. She's now, and she, I'm not kidding you, her energy level was so high right before this. Now she's able to go over, be very focused. This is a child with really significant vision loss. Get really close, see what he's doing, make a request for the kind of animal she wants and have this wonderful, you know, very warm social exchange with him. It, it, was, it was amazing. That kind of stuff is happening all the time with kids with charge and kids who are deaf blind. We have to notice it. And we have to recognize when they're doing those kinds of behaviors. And she did that. She did it for like 45 seconds. And then she was ready to go on. And then she had a great time at the rest of the party. No meltdowns, anything like that. The final slide is just about always remembering. And this has to do with the social supports. Remember, that's an evidence-based practice for autism. Is for a lot of our kids, um, our kids who are deafblind, we have to, that, that trusted intervener is the person that can really help make this happen right? They're the secret sauce. Um, they can make sure that the child's feeling, you know, that the whole situation is set up for the child to be feeling really confident. Um, they can be the person that's helping to bridge the other person who they're interacting with understanding. Um, they can help the child pay attention, joint attention to activities and, um, some kids are going to need really specific instruction and practice to learn how to take turns and negotiate and share with others and listen, but that can be done. But I always, again, just encourage that to be done in natural context. And I just looked at the time and realized that we have two minutes left. So this is just a review. I talked about this earlier, just my way to say, let's not forget any of these things when you're bridging those two things. And then I'm at the end and I can take questions. Here's my contact, happy to talk to anybody about any of this. We're not in our offices yet, so you can only leave me voicemail there, but I will get back to you and I will stop my share. Jennifer Oldenburg, our Alabama DeafBlind Project says great information and well presented for many disciplines. Oh good. And, which is for sure, because you do touch on so many areas. Um, Krista loved this format for trainings of bridging what the team knows to what will work best for the kiddos with deaf blindness. Uh, you're awesome, Julie. And of course, a lot more awesomeness. 
So, Julie, it just sounds like everybody is extremely thankful for you being here. We truly thank you for your time. Hey, Dottie, Dottie from North Carolina, our DeafBlind Project, okay. saying yeah. many thanks, of course. Um, and, again, just to let everybody know, I know a lot, a lot, a lot of people are asking about the recordings. Please, we really, really encourage you to be here on time because we will not be sending these recordings out, not for a while. Um, we have a lot of work to do on them. There's a lot of accessibility that has to be done on them. So please don't miss out if you can. Try and be here. Um, we start every single Tuesday, Thursday at 2.30, and we finish at 4 Eastern time. Okay? I know everyone has an opportunity to attend so many great webinars out there, and we truly thank you for being here. Just knowing that you want to add this additional information to your repertoire is extremely important to us. The more professionals we have out there, the better, especially when it comes to our growing population that are being identified all over the world in deaf blindness. Um, Julie has also given her contact information, so we'll be sure to get that to you because I know Key was asking for your contact mm -hmm. information to follow sure. up with you. So we'll certainly get that as well. Again, a special thank you to our interpreters. Thank you mm -hmm. so much for all of your help. Thank you so much to our deaf blind projects and a huge Thank you to Julie for your time and energy. All right, you stay warm up there in Chicago, yeah. and everybody else, stay safe. Bye. Thank Bye. you, guys. Bye. Thank you, everyone.